Welcome to the Kaleidoscope Podcast. I'm your host, George Salas. In the second episode of the show's new segment, Invisible Book Buddies, I speak with my friend Jacob Pasco about Mark J. Mirsky's Valworm Jacob, first published in 1967 and currently out of print, like most of Mirsky's work. My guest, Jacob Pasco, is a writer and filmmaker based in Vancouver. He holds degrees in film production and literature from the University of British Columbia and has since developed a body of work spanning narrative, avant-garde film, and music videos, as well as fiction, criticism, and theory. His practice looks at notions of the beyond, the transcendent, and the apocalyptic, primarily from a Jewish mystical perspective. He is currently researching and developing a feature film with the support of the Canadian Council of the Arts. He has also contributed work to the Kaleidoscope, including a review of Angela Woodward's Inc. and a guest post on my column Invisible Books, in which he shines a light on Zalman Schnur's A Death, Notes on a Suicide. So, please sit back and enjoy our conversation. Hey, Jake, how's it going? Good, George. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being on the show, episode two. Uh, let's just dive in, shall we? All right. I want to take it from the top. Can you tell me about your Jewish heritage and your faith and, and the background associated with that? Yeah, absolutely. Big question, I guess. Uh, what's my Jewish heritage? I mean, um, it's in me. I was raised... Uh, I guess you could say observantly, you know, I had Shabbat dinner every week and synagogue most Saturdays and such. Um, but I was raised in a uh, stretch of Judaism uh, called conservative Judaism, which is a bit of a misnomer because it is on the more uh, liberal side of things. Um, but it's part of a tradition of uh, very rational Judaism, stretching from the kind of Maimonidean, Aristotelian uh, way of thinking of things that are, it's very pragmatic, it's it's a way of integrating, um, you know, non-rational religion with uh, a rational, pragmatic world. Um, and so secularism really dominated my Jewish learning and Jewish upbringing. Um, so law and ethic was kind of forward and spirituality and uh you know mysticism quite backward um mm. and you know it's it's uh the, the main problem i had with it growing up was it was just kind of it was kind of boring you know i never, i didn't leave it in in anger or uh frustration like some people leave uh their religions but really more so out of uh i felt like i had more important things to do um but it, in the past maybe two or three years I've been returning to Judaism with a curious inquisitive uh, sensibility to just kind of uncover these sort of strange spiritual mystic images that were uh, occulted and codified and, and there in my upbringing, but just kind of buried under layers of, uh, of practicality and rationality. Um, and that's where you found me today. Would you consider yourself practicing or faithful? Because most of the Jews in popular culture I know of are se totally secular. Yeah. Well, I, it's hard to say. I'm, I'm practicing in that, you know, I'm, I've still never had bacon or cheeseburgers. Uh, that's <laughs> As a, a vegan, uh, neither have I. Yeah, okay. All right. <laughs> I hear they're great. Um, but, uh, I mean, it, Judaism's funny in that way because uh, it, it's hard to separate Judaism from the law uh, mm -hmm. that it's based on. I mean, we're a people of the law, a people of the book. The, the Ju Judaism was created when God gave uh, the laws to uh, his people, Israel. Um, so in, until I break the final law, there kind of feels like a, a perpetual immortal practice and quality to me. Uh, 
I feel guilty whenever I break a law or whenever I don't go to synagogue or whenever I don't uh, celebrate a particular holiday. Um, but it's hard. It's hard to mm-hmm. be practicing and also uh, be part of the world. I think that's why there's so many insular, isolated Jewish communities to this day. Uh, it's a lot easier <laughs> to, to practice. When I say Jewish fiction, mm-hmm. Jewish literature in particular, what qualities come to mind? In other words, what makes a Jewish novel Jewish? Yeah, hard to say. I mean, you know, Jewish fiction has wide-reaching qualities, obviously. I think it's hard to discuss them without generalizing a lot. I think, um, you know, European Jewish literature and Yiddish literature tend to have more blushes of fantastic quality, um, whereas American Jewish literature leans into kind of a, a robust realist tradition. Um, I'm no scholar. I just, I read a lot, but, uh, you know, you can consider like the Mount Rushmore of like serious Jewish American writers as like Philip Roth and Bernard Malamud and Saul Bellow and Chaim Potok. Maybe you can include Mailer too. And, and, and there you see this anxiety between, you know, the non-rational storytelling of a religious ethno group meeting with, uh, the hyper-rational agnostic pragmatism of, the American 20th century um, and American uh, sensibilities. So there's the, there's kind of a lens on Jewishness through this dream of assimilation into that uh, society. And, and so there, and you see, you know, Roth's kind of erotic dread and Malamud's kind of uh, urban ennui and um, Potok's kind of religious isolationism and, and such. But I mean, obviously, you know, throughout the 20th century of Jewish literature, there's, great syntheses of these traditions um, that maybe go less noticed than than those guys. There's like Cynthia Ozick, who kind of really effortlessly kind of intertwines the, uh, like a folkloric tradition with modernity and uh, um, Clarice Lispector, who uh, shines a light on, um, you know, the history of uh, dense, complicated wordplay and linguistic uh, qualities mm-hmm. to, to, of Jewish mysticism um, and Mark Mursky, who, who kind of channel channels the, the magic apparatus of uh, the Jewish joke into novel form. But mm. what, I mean, what makes a Jewish novel Jew- Jewish? I think is hard to say. Cause you know, I'd say it has to be written by a Jew, but I find Borges really Jewish and I'd say it has to have Jews mm-hmm. in it, but Kafka never mentions, you know, Judaism explicitly. And um, even John Updike, he has his yeah. Beck books mm-hmm. and he's not Jewish. To my knowledge. A hundred percent. Uh I think you know, in general, uh and again it's another generalization, but I think Jewish literature or, or things that I find Jewish um often imply overtly or covertly um like a grand spiritual mystic dread of some sort that battles with um this urge for a secular pragmatism. Um I think Jewishness over the course of millennia, again, generalized, there's this recurring dialectic of assimilation and isolationism in, you know, the dream of urban intellectuality or uh, isolated in-group debate and a a dialectic of, you know, the rational and the non-rational of, like, academic practicality and messianic mystical dreams. And uh, whichever wins out in the end, I think, depends on the author. And I think they're usually funny. I think Jewish literature is usually kind of funny. Yes. And that sort of goes back to what I was thinking about in terms of Jewish tropes in literature Mm -hmm. um, that you can even make a list of. Yeah. One that comes to mind would be the kind of neuroticism that's embodied by Woody Allen. Right. And his work. I don't know how much that comes from him perpetuating it versus it being in the air as it were. Yeah. Uh, And then you have the sort of overbearing babushka mother type figure. Mm -hmm. Um, These are the things that Joshua Cohen sort of rehashed in his latest work, the Netanyahu's, which I found to be completely (laughs) derivative of, of Roth and, well, and I did learn that he worships pretty much Roth. Right. So, well, it's hard not to. I think. I think it's hard not to be a Jewish American writer and not 
uh, have a little bit of, you know, probably the most towering Jewish American writer of uh, the past century in, in mm -hmm. your work. Uh, yes, he's pretty good and very prolific. Absolutely, yeah. I know you didn't uh, you didn't care too much for uh, the Netanyahu's. <laughs> I liked it uh, a lot. Um, I appreciated, uh, you know, kind of an updating of that style. Not maybe not an updating of the style, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, using that style. Um, I could see that in the 21st century. But I I, I read it uh, at that point, uh, ignorant to uh, Cohen's past work, which is definitely way more your speed. Yes, compared yeah. to his past work, it should it it <laughs> reeks of selling out. And but he won the Pulitzer Prize. So hey, you know, good maybe, for him. Maybe right? it works. <laughs> <laughs> he did something right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, you mentioned Mark mm -hmm. Mursky. And so I was wondering, how does he fit into that general notion of Jewish fiction, at least based on the one debut novel that we read? Yeah, I think uh, I think he does a great thing um, that I haven't read a lot uh, in American Jewish fiction where he uses kind of the structure and the language of the Jewish joke as his uh, ground in which to to write off of. Mm. Um, and I think there's such a proud, cool, long uh, tradition of this style of literature that doesn't, I mean, if you can call joke literature, um, it's usually, you know, a verbal form. Um, but uh, there's a long tradition of this type of language that doesn't necessarily get um, used in the form of a novel. Uh, and, uh, you know, I really appreciate it. And I could, I could hear so many of the people I grew up in, in the way people talked in the constant, I think there's like, you know, four question marks per page, uh, and, and immediate answers after he says something like, um, I read a bit of his sort of autobiography, um, my search for the Messiah. And he said something like, um, ask, ask is even more a Jewish command than eat, eat, uh, yeah, there's there's certain other qualities of this book. I think the, you know the the constant repetition of people's occupations in conjunction with um, their characters. There's uh, two characters that um, sort of dominate the first bit of the novel: the left-handed Moyle, um, and a Moyle is a a, a circumciser, um, mm -hmm. and the uh, Cantor from Havana, which in a American Jewish accent I think would be uh, would rhyme as the Canta from Havana or something like that. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you have Druckmann the Druckmann. You can yes, exactly. pick up on, you know, the attention to language, even in those yeah. brief character names. It's kind of, it reminds me of like uh, people rereading Shakespeare, but with the accent that uh, people in England might've had at the time, you know, and mm, finding exactly. new rhymes in that way. But uh, I think that that constant um, re uh, bringing up of people's, occupations you see that a lot in jewish jokes because in, in general the occupation and the person um are uh, paramount to the setup of the actual joke itself uh and and so throughout the whole novel people are are um inextricable from the role they play in this insular society uh mm -hmm. and he calls this this book kind of an apocalypse of this society and so um it's interesting to see the kind of blown apart state that we find um, many of these roles uh, in 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 this uh, setting, but I mean, sorry to go back to your question. Um, I think his usage of the format of the Jewish joke in the form of a novel, I think, is novel in itself, um, and is an exciting uh, quality to Jewish American writing that I that I haven't stumbled upon before. And you mentioned how the European Jewish literature tends to have a not a surreal aspect but a fantastic aspect to it totally yeah and in that sense Mursky would be more in line with the, the european sensibility than his american counterparts yeah i read this terrific book this year um called the secret life of puppets which is uh this sort of analysis of um it's by uh, uh i think she's professor usually from this uh woman victoria nelson um and it sort of marks the trajectory of um the fantastic 
into and out from the Enlightenment um, where uh, religion stopped being uh, a day-to-day... Um, what's the way I can phrase this? Uh, religion s- stopped being kind of the alpha and omega of daily thought uh, mm-hmm. and um, was sort of sent into the underground. Um, but religious questioning still persisted. You know, people questioning the immortal soul, the beyond, the transcendent... Um, divinity in whatever form it comes in um but it had to kind of go underground and be questioned in the form of uh, fiction and she's she sort of marks um that serious fiction in europe because it sort of had you know a longer history of uh um of uh the fantastic and and in in religion um serious fiction still could carry that fantastic quality with it where in whereas in america um the fantastic was relegated to pulp fiction to comic books to um you know genre fiction uh as as a separate category to serious writers um again these are this is a generalization of of her of her points but um you do see more of a tendency uh to the long history of folklore and magic um and uh, a sort of a mystical bent to superstition in European writers like Schultz or Kafka or uh, uh, Isaac Singer's kind of early career. And I tend to prefer that strand of Jewish uh, literature. I haven't been able to, I haven't delved too far into the world of Yiddish literature, uh, mm. but I did briefly in, a, in a, something I wrote for the Kaleidoscope, which I had a lot of fun with. But absolutely. Yes, can you tell us about the Your Invisible Book contribution? Yeah, I reviewed a book called A Death, Notes on a Suicide, which is a very morose title um, by an author named Zalman Schneur. Uh, and it's sort of a dark, mystical take on a European city novel, uh, like a Notes from Underground um, type of thing where a disaffected protagonist uh, philosophizes and moralizes and walks around uh in this case, an unnamed city, I think usually an unnamed city and, uh, you know, in the end kills himself as referenced by the title. Um, but there's, a a particular Jewish quality to this, um, obviously because the protagonist is Jewish, but like I mentioned, um, before this, there's, there's a very acute awareness of this encroaching, uh, mystic darkness that, mingles and and doesn't necessarily mix well with the protagonist's uh, urban life and I, f- I found that dread which feels so contemporary to me or felt so contemporary to me really interesting to see in a novel that predates um the holocaust by you know 50 or so mm-hmm. years would you say that book is even more morose serious solemn compared to mersky's that worm jacob definitely i mean uh a death doesn't have the sense of humor that uh, that Worm Jacob has, mm-hmm. and there's there's a how should I say this? Uh, there's so let me try again. <laughs> a death doesn't have uh, the sense of humor that that Worm Jacob has, um, and there's something that I prefer about that Worm Jacob because it has that sense of humor. Not that it takes the edge off, but it does add a dimension um, and a complexity to its bleakness its inherent Mm. bleakness would you say that it's almost too humorous for its own good Mm, no i think uh i I think it needed to explore humor um i mean if if my take on it uh, as having the structure of a jewish joke has traction i think it it needs to to have humor in order to kind of elucidate that Mm. uh that jewish literary tradition how about you? This is where we diverge okay. a little bit. I I thought it needed a bit more of the tragedy mm-hmm. to balance out the humor. And as it happens, I followed up Thou Worm Jacob immediately with his second novel, Blue Hill Avenue. Mm-hmm. And I found the opposite problem. There's too much tragedy, mm. not enough humor. So maybe if he continues that thread in his later work maybe he found a balance that's better for me absolutely in particular, but well i i mean i will say the tragic parts of that worm jacob were my most favorite parts uh mm. you know there's there's a foil like quality to it though where um 
it was a bit of, of, of a surprise when a section would end on uh, a, on a somber note um, that I appreciated. When usually mm-hmm. they would end on some kind of ridiculous image or uh, or sentiment, which maybe adds a a dynamic of sincerity that maybe is lost in some other Jewish works, yeah. like uh, Bo is afraid. I know. Our mutual friend Matt did not like it for its lack of sincerity, but uh-huh. that actually didn't bother me at all. No, I mean I think there's a there's an interesting comparison to be made um, between Bo is Afraid and, and Thou Worm Jacob, uh, in in the context of uh, its irreverence, um, mm-hmm. and then those moments of kind of intense darkness uh, take on an interesting meaning um, as they kind of come in between these almost saccharine rays of uh of sunshine i think this would be the perfect time to share excerpts that can highlight the comedy and the tragedy and i have an excerpt picked out that can highlight the comedy yeah and it starts with a character speaking to another character named pfeffer he says pedal them for me pfeffer take half what you get said the friend better still who needs them? Give me six bucks. A hundred brushes are yours. And he thinks to himself, A hundred brushes? Pfeffer calculated quickly. At fifty cents a brush, they would bring him fifty dollars. Pfeffer was beside himself. A thousand percent profit. Things like this can snowball. He rushed home to his daughter Lily. Back me, he cried. I'll be Rothschild. She spat in his face. It took an afternoon of wrangling, crying, and insulting to wring the six dollars out of her. The next day, Pfeffer set out to sell brushes. The first he sold to Lily. That was a feat King Solomon's merchants couldn't equal. Brush your hair, wash the woodwork, scrub the toilet. Lily, this brush does everything. A lifetime it lasts. She paid to get him out of the house. The second one he sold to Lily's landlady, their upstairs neighbor. He had to get down on his knees and clean her kitchen floor to do it. The third went to the blind cripple on the corner. Pfeffer didn't exactly sell it to him. He asked him to hold it for a minute and then took fifty cents out of the collection box. Pfeffer figured that after an hour of holding the brush, the blind would get the idea. End scene. End scene. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so there is, I think, a pretty good idea of the irreverence you have him taking advantage of a blind man yeah for 50 cents this is actually the second time uh in the book someone steals money from a collection box <laughs> from a charity collection box yeah <laughs> which is very funny pretty much mm-hmm. i mean i don't know where that comes from exactly but well i think um there's a there's a a a grotesque quality to some of the characters in the book if not all of if them. not all of them <laughs> that uh that reminded me a lot of uh a john waters film where mm-hmm. uh humor arises out of you know your nervous reaction to the uh kind of disturbing um ideals of the characters within uh if not the disturbing actions they take um i found that particularly true within the sections of uh of dries it and ends off the left-handed moil and the canter from Havana uh, that dominate the first bit of the book um, mm-hmm. where they uh, they're they're really hungry characters I always find the the stock character the hungry character in a sitcom <laughs> uh, very funny um, but they're very hungry and they steal or or manipulate food out of the hands of uh, of these two old ladies mm-hmm. that was actually one of my favorite parts me too I feel there is such a concentration to that first quarter which i didn't quite feel in the the rest of it yeah but, it does kind of transition into almost a, a framing device for a short story collection yeah in a way halfway through the book but they yeah for the first bit of the novel kind of jump from corner to corner taking advantage of people to satisfy their uh needs and in, in this section where they uh take this lady's food. I don't know. There's, a, there's an especially kind of grotesque quality to it. Um, that, uh, like John Waters, these, these kind of gross caricatures, um, share this sort of antisocial element, uh, sorry, this antisocial sentiment, like a skepticism of both Jewish and non-Jewish, uh, society, um, that, uh, is personified within 
these characters. Uh, it's not that they actually express any philosophies or ideas, but uh, um, their behavior uh, depicts this ideal um, that's kind of gross and weird, makes you kind of shudder. I, I have a high tolerance for the grotesque. Totally. I mean... <laughs> and I love the grotesque. Yeah. So I would even go as far as to say that I wanted more grotesquery. Right. And more of the craziness. Yeah. Which is not to say that there isn't plenty mm -hmm. in here, especially for the average reader. Mm -hmm. And we can get into that. I mean, part of what you were mentioning as far as the fantastic mm -hmm. elements that could be traced to a kind of European sensibility, uh, there's a, a, a sort of climax in this in which the characters are in a car and... It just ascends. The vehicle ascends uh, during a car crash. Yeah. What did you make of that scene? I it, exactly what you're making of it of uh, this transposition of a fantastic European sensibility, literally onto American streets. Um, there's a sense that the, the it takes place on Blue Hill Avenue, and there are certain sections where he writes of the street uh, in an anthropomorphized way. I have this one open where. He des describes sprawling wooden buildings, crossbreeds of mansions and tenements, uh, rotting Corinthian pillars tilted toward them. The sagging porch has hardly supported the weight of a few old ladies. Um, it is it's such a like a corporal way of describing a street as if this this body of a of a urban landscape launches this car into the air and, and has it float there. It is very beautiful. It's I mean it's it's uh, it's very grandiose i'd be remiss if i didn't uh invoke one of the most famous jewish characters in all of literature bloom uh -huh. from ulysses uh -huh. and he has a fairly similar ascension in the cyclops episode where he is in the carriage trying to escape from the metaphorical cyclops from the pub and they just ascend into the heavens yeah i would be surprised if that was a coincidence these two scenes for sure i mean they would they also they ascend uh i believe in a in a horse-drawn cart uh, yes so there's there's a there's a mythic quality within there too a european mythic quality i can't speak too much on the differing sensibilities between europe and america uh, there's definitely people smarter than i that have written lots and lots about it um but you know the Jewish history of the sorry the American Jewish history is one of um, a, a very particular type of European trying to find their place in uh, a melting pot and um, finding it in odd, strange, oblique angles. Uh, and uh, I, I think this that uh, that image is a is a really nice uh, distillation of that. Exactly, and. With all this irreverent humor going on, my question was, how much would you consider this outright blasphemy? I know Philip Roth, back in the day, he got flack from the Jewish community right out of the gates yeah. with his first collection, Goodbye Columbus. Although I feel like the Jewish community warmed up to him after some time. I think, um, I mean, you know, Jews love to give flack <laughs> you know i think uh, i think um it probably did and probably would get flack um and be embraced uh by other aspects of uh, the jewish I, I embrace it i like it um but there's uh, you know within jewish humor as a whole there is a, a, a immortal loving mocking quality uh to it um freud i think called jewish humor a form of psychic masochism and it's unique in the tradition of ethnic humor styles as having a, a, a as distinctly having a mocking of the in group as opposed to a mocking of the out group. Um, the Larry David famously said in a, in a Curb episode, he got accused of being a self hating Jew, and he <laughs> replies, "I hate myself, but it's not because I'm Jewish." And I think I think <laughs> Freud would say, um, "You do hate yourself because you're Jewish, but you don't hate the Jewish part of yourself, but the." vessel of hating yourself is a jewish quality um 
but you kind of love that you hate yourself. So th- that that grotesque caricature is quality to it. Um, I think has plenty of precedence within uh, Jewish humorous tales, um, which maybe I'm saying it's not groundbreaking, but uh, but um, I think it might be a little groundbreaking to the degree that it it uh, is found in this book, or at least it doesn't have a lot of parallels. But I mean, there's so many. There, there's a line when a canter and a may uh, when a canter and a moil smile at a mashulach, a herring is stinking somewhere. Uh, I don't think there is a there's a Jew in America that wouldn't uh, smile at a line like mm. that. You know, um, even though you know the image and the scent that it gives off isn't necessarily uh, rosy, um, but it's beautiful. It's nice. It's sweet. Uh, you know, Roth would have that antisocial sentiment that characters in that Worm Jacob have, um, but to a less absurd, more formal degree. And as his career progressed from Goodbye Columbus into, you know, his later works, um, mm-hmm. there was, a, a, I think, a different perspective, uh, a, maybe a less furious perspective, um, but still a searching quality. Was it Philip Roth's The Ghost Rider in, in which a character lusts after Anne Frank? Oh, I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me. I, haven't, I didn't know I believe that so. That's pretty good. So um, speaking of grotesquery, that's what I'm talking about as yeah. far as, you know, give me the, yeah, go full the, on. the most subconscious filth offense you can think of. And yeah, Mark Mursky, Mark Mursky delivers on that front. Mm-hmm. Uh, to to one degree or another, depending on who you're asking, and I was curious about if he had gotten flack. Uh-huh. And I, as you know, I have a huge interview with him yeah. that's going to be coming out in the next couple of months or so. And he touches on that because I asked him, "What kind of flack did you get? Did people accuse you of blasphemy?" And then I zoomed out a little bit and i asked him is anything sacred that devil's advocate question and he said everything is up for grabs the biblical books delight in this and if you read between the lines of the talmud there are many instances of this comedy but without a sense of humor you will not hear it i would often surprise pious and impious jewish students whose knowledge of the rabbis was gleaned only from their studies at conventional orthodox schools, with quotes I had come across in my frequent wanderings through the Sonsino translation of the Babylonian Talmud. Yeah, I, I'm on board with him. I, I think there's a, a ridiculous funny quality to uh, so many canonical books of Jewish law and Jewish scripture and uh and whatnot. I, I don't know why there is this immortal um, humor uh, within Jewish artistic expression. Um, I think sometimes it, it comes at the cost of uh, exploring spirituality and mysticism and the beyond and the transcendent, um, which I really long for in a lot of Jewish art that I don't necessarily mm-hmm. get. Um, I think you have blushes of it in that worm Jacob uh, that I appreciate it. And he delves more into that in that, uh, that autobiography of his that I mentioned. Um, and it seems like it, it would become a, a big aspect of his uh, life and work. Um, well, you mentioned immortal humor. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's more to that phrase than you intended oh. because I'm thinking about how laughter is sort of the last resort in the face of outright adversity or even death Mm -hmm. and you know people in the death camps you know they weren't completely immune to cracking jokes and what have you you know know i'm trying to get at gallows humor is uh uh, a a big feature of uh of of the jewish humor that's that um you know the mocking of the in-group that that freud points to um Mm -hmm. as you know there's i think there's very any any dark Holocaust joke that I hear that a Jew tells so much more often mocks the the Jewish situation as opposed to you know Nazi perpetrators, mm-hmm. um, and you know what a what a ridiculous situation we found ourselves in. Yeah, my favorite uh, 
uh, Holocaust joke, which isn't, I don't think it's too dark for your audience, but uh, a Holocaust survivor dies and goes to heaven and God says to him, how did you enjoy your life? And he says, uh, oh, you know, I was married to a beautiful woman for 60 years. We had children and grandchildren. I saw so many beautiful things, but if I'm going to be honest, God, the Shoah cast a shadow over my entire life. And God says, well, what was that? And he goes, the Shoah, the Holocaust, it, it was a pall that followed me till my dying breath. And God goes, I don't know what you're saying. And he goes, the Holocaust, the systematic murder of uh, 6 million Jews from 1939 to 1945. It, it uh, was something I never forgot. And God said, oh, I don't really know what you're talking about. And the Jew goes, ah, you had to be there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I, think there's, I think there's a kind of an ultimate Jewish joke quality to that, that uh, it's that lasting immortal reference, uh, literally in this uh, scene, um, that you know follows Jews into the into the other world. <laughs> and to sort of switch to the other side of that, I, there was this phrase that was scrawled in a wall at a death camp. I don't remember the exact context, but it was something to the effect that God will have to beg on his knees for forgiveness. Right. Which is the complete opposite. Absolutely, of the I know. Humor. I I, and I think that uh, that darkness, um, this kind of like apophatic, searching nothingness, um, this uh, inescapable God that follows you, um, and yet an anger at not being able to know that God is is something that I miss in a lot of Jewish art. I'm, I mean, there's so much to come through, and I'm uh, excited to find stuff that really speaks to that. I think. Um, you know, Lispector and uh, uh, Kafka uh, have that quality to them. It's uh, it's a darkness that I that I that I really want to see. I think, um, and and a, and a nod to the surreality and the absurdity um, that sh- that differs from humor, uh, or maybe that that turns away from humor. That um, I think is rarer in things. And Thou Worm Jacob does have. At least some of that. For sure. It it has a lot of melancholy, I think. Can you share with us one of those scenes? Give us the context. For sure. I think this is actually the other uh the other end of the chapter that you shared, which is interesting. Um Pfeffer, the character uh that you mentioned uh in your passage, um gets a, a job at a synagogue uh elsewhere in New England, uh where he's sort of teaching uh, uh, children. Uh, his job is ostensibly to teach children kind of Bible tales in Hebrew and uh, and whatnot. But he's not a very bright man, so he just makes up stories um, that he's gone through when he lived in the old country of escaping Cossacks and saving uh, people uh, on the brink of death. Um, but he's discovered to be a fraud by his daughter as he teaches his grandson and she chases him out. And this is the, this is the end of that chapter. So he's teaching his, his son and his, or his grandson, his grandson uh, says, you're full of the little boy screamed. And he says, you're a no good little gutnik, Mr. Heschel shouted the shamus and I'm going to break your neck. He jumped up an apple splattered on the wall behind him. Pfeffer pushed his chair aside and began to chase Heschel around the room. Who should come running in? Lily, his daughter. She ran up to Pfeffer and grabbed him. Don't touch him. Don't touch the little one. It's your fault. I heard. He's right. You're full of it. She backed Pfeffer into the corner. I listened Monday, Tuesday behind the door. You know nothing. A big fake. From behind his mother, Heschel kicked the shamus in the calf. Lily grabbed Pfeffer by the lapels and shook him. You got the brains of a dog. Pfeffer fell on his knees and began to bark. He bared his teeth at Heschel. Stop, stop, screamed Lily, kicking her father. Are you crazy? The shamus stood up. He looked at his daughter. Her eyes were glittering green with hatred. A queen of Sodom. Pfeffer spat in her eye. He caught her wrist and spat again. He turned and walked out of the house. He never spoke to her again. Ten days later, the cops brought him home. After that, the old men took care of him. One of the regulars at G&G would take him by the arm and lead him to Lily's on Lawrence Street, walk up the stairs with him to the second landing and knock on the door. Pfeffer slept in his old bed. He left the house every morning before his daughter woke up. They met once a month when his old age pension arrived. Half of it she took for rent, so he had enough for coffee and a few bagels during the month. She could take it all. Pfeffer didn't care. He was through with life. He lived in dreams. I think he lived in dreams is a is a really beautiful point in image to end on uh, in, in a section that finds this character, uh, or maybe where we find this character exclusively 
in imaginary tales that he spins. Right before this section, he's about to tell a true story of how he escaped uh, from the old country and moved to America and is cut off by his grandson, you know, being a little shit and not mm-hmm. listening to him. I think that uh, the horror of finding that uh, your personal salvation or maybe of not finding your personal salvation in, uh, in a country that supposedly is going to welcome you with more open arms um, is, is hugely emotionally affecting. And, and coming at the end of him kind of collapsing Jewish history into a present moment, into a, into a singular individual in these fake stories that he, he spins, um, this great nod to the surreal uh, that I want more of in, in Jewish fiction that I was saying. Yes, and there's a there's a rabbi, Rabbi Lux, who appears in Thou Worm Jacob, uh, basically as a cameo, especially when you take into consideration the fact that he is featured as the main protagonist in the sophomore novel Blue Hill Avenue. Something of a mm. Mursky verse going on here. Nice. <laughs> um, but as I mentioned, I thought this one had much more of the emotional, tragic side of things rather than mm-hmm. the humor, although it's still there. Uh, but just to give you a better idea of what's in here, we have Rabbi Lux, who he gets married to this high-strung, hysterical wife who is very controlling of him uh, and his whereabouts and gets into absolute... I guess, a panic attack Mm -hmm. in public if he's not home from his work right on the dot. So you have this kind of very much strained, dysfunctional marriage going on. And at the same time, one of his students who went off to war is missing. He doesn't know if he was killed in war, if he was taken as a POW. Uh, but the mother is asking everyone, have you seen my son? Where's my son? And she ends up calling him, and he is trying to you know, balance out comforting the parent being a rabbi. Uh, but he says something that gives her... I don't know if you would go so far as to say a false sense of hope, uh, but essentially it causes her to keep calling him and calling him and calling him. And that puts strain on him uh, in his position as a rabbi and further strain on the already strained marriage. Uh, And yeah, that's just the general outline. There's other stuff, of course, in this novel, Uh, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that like Alice in Wonderland and how she goes down the rabbit hole. Rabbi Lux in this novel goes down the toilet hole into another world. Oh, sounds great. It's a very surreal chapter. <laughs> Probably my favorite if I had to pick. That sounds that sounds pretty awesome. I, I, I would also be remiss to, to mention that, you know, in, in um, me talking about my longing for this kind of surreal uh, darkness that has a basis in Jewish mysticism, but maybe not so much in um, uh, mainstream Jewish literature. It does sound like uh, Mirsky, uh in his lifetime has gone down a similar rabbit hole that I have briefly started going down um, in the history of, uh, of Jewish mysticism. He mentions uh, Gershom Sholem a lot, and um, uh, I think he did mention um, Joshua Trachtenberg's uh, he wrote this study in Judaism as a folk religion, Jewish magic and superstition. It sounds like uh, the, the Red Adam Mirsky's novel from 1990, I think his most recent one that's uh, come out, um, looks like it delves pretty deeply into the, the dark aspects of uh, Jewish spiritual belief, at, at least from a kind of syncretic folk religion uh, standpoint, which, yeah, it's really fun for me to to go down these routes. I think uh, a, a lot of Jewish fiction and Jewish uh, cinema gets lost in this kind of anxiety-ridden verisimilitude because, you know, Jewish history is so replete with uh, tragedies and narratives and, and history uh, that took place and are historically documented in, in primary source uh, 
texts and uh, facts and, and uh, newspapers and, and whatever. Um, but there's a, there's a separate uh, history of non-rational, ecstatic, uh, mystic speculation um, upon the nature of reality that uh, I think excites me a little bit more. Uh, mm. And it sounds like Mursky, it sounds like it, excite, it excites Mursky a little bit more too. So you mentioned Red Adam. Mm-hmm. That actually came out in 1990. Yes. From Sun and Moon Press. His latest is Pudding Stone, and that le- okay. is, is from 2014. So it's been actually okay. quite a while since he's yeah. released anything. And he did tell me in the forthcoming interview that he has a handful of unpublished manuscripts that he can't find a publisher for. Mm-hmm. So that's, you know, a missing piece to the puzzle of his oeuvre Mm -hmm. but yeah it would be interesting to see the kind of trajectory uh, on multiple levels of what he's dealing with i mean i think you see that with the i mean it's interesting to read that worm jacob seeing the trajectory that his interest in judaism and jewishness went on which is a search into the non-rational um because that worm jacob as it begins and as a beginning to a career you see him kind of skittering on the surface of these not necessarily stock characters uh stock jewish characters but you know aspects of the jewish quotidian of the jewish day-to-day that ends with there's kind of a dual ending of this chariot rising into the sky and uh also an ending of uh jews gathering together for a, a prayer service um you almost see him teetering on two directions to go down uh with a, maybe a career and maybe I'm being too grand and giving that metaphor, but, uh, in what way specifically, what are the two trajectories, the trajectory of, um, continuing to look at the, uh, Jewish quotidian experience of, uh, Jewish life in America, the verisimilitude of, of the Jewish experience, the experience or the surreality of, uh, the Jewish imagination of Jewish thought, of uh, Jewish spiritual expression um, as in soft and dries and rise off into the sky. Mm. Well, the the true ending of the novel, where they're trying to find all the members from Minion, mm-hmm. they f- recruit a horse. Uh-huh. So I mean, it's not completely, you know, you're, you're totally right. quotidian. But I, I understand what you're saying. It's not as yeah. out there as an ascension. Yes, uh-huh. the uh, it, the the final chapter is called "Crash Ending," mm-hmm. uh, and so it is kind of like they crash back down to to reality. I mean, it it uh, it might be interesting to note. I don't have any um, profound elaborations on it, but it does end in a basement, mm-hmm. uh, the exact opposite of the sky. Yeah, and it's a sweet ending. You know, it ends and uh, everyone's kind of happy and uh, nice to be together. And there's. Uh, let me just confirm, I think, kind of a cyclical aspiration. The State of the Jews, dot, 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 is the final words of the book, and the opening part of the book is, I've got the whole state of Jewish affairs right between my fingers. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe there's kind of a Finnegan's Wake aspiration where the whole thing can be read as a circle. I did get the sense of well, of questioning where this was heading as far as being able to wrap up the various threads and characters in this novel, but I do think uh, Mirsky did well with with that final scene. Mm-hmm. I agree. It's uh, it's sweet, kind of seeing them gather together in this uh, this very Jewish tableau. And why do you think this book is invisible? Do you think it deserves more readers? I think this book is invisible uh, because it's very strange. It's got a very strange structure. Like we kind of mentioned, it begins as kind of like a tight, maybe not a tight novel, but, you know, we have sort of two protagonists and we sort of follow them from scene to scene before we launch into kind of recursive uh, narrations of uh, uh, other characters' past and interior lives. Um, And then it does kind of jump into almost a short story collection where uh, we don't necessarily have that narrative link between uh, each of the characters who's, whom the chapters explore. Um, not that uh, novels with unique structures weren't successful in the 60s. That might not be a perfect reason. But, uh, you know, that niche coupled with um, the niche of 
uh, highly specific, usually unelaborated upon uh, Yiddish and Jewish jargon, mm -hmm. compounded with a non unconventional narrative structure, uh, makes it a hard sell. I don't know. I mean, you told me about it, and I was on board. Yeah. Well, this was published in 1967. The 60s mm -hmm. was a pretty fertile decade as far as publishers being willing to publish out there experimental type novels but this totally. is not as experimental as some of the other things many of the other things that were coming out in that decade or uh, even after that decade so in that sense it's unconventional but not enough maybe to garner the right. interest of a certain readership that was looking for those types yeah. of extremely quirky uh, anti-novels even. Yeah. And then we mentioned the fantastical elements, which may have been, could have been in a general sense, brushed to the side as comic booky or even mm -hmm. sci-fi or fantasy, but it doesn't have enough of those elements to even be, pigeonholed into that to find that kind of readership so in in some sense it's a bit unclassifiable and uh you know therefore kind of a perfect uh candidate for becoming invisible i think uh you know th there was a vonnegut-esque uh quality to its irreverence and to its narrative structure and i just checked yes. slaughterhouse five came out uh 69 um which is hardly invisible yes um but i think uh you know maybe is about all of america and all of america's experiences in world war ii whereas this is a small percentage of america mm -hmm. um, and uh, slaughterhouse five was very much seen as science fiction it, it didn't have a high place in the literary canon at first mm -hmm. and so i think you know, there's a big readership of sci-fi writers who maybe helped to get that novel its jump start, as right. it were. Because I know Salman Rushdie, he wrote uh, a thesis or an essay that com that uh, compares and contrasts the usage and perception of time in mm -hmm. Vonnegut's novel and Proust's In Search of Lost Time. And some people were considering that almost blasphemy in and of itself to compare this so-called sci-fi novel to this great work of capital L literature. Uh, right. But we know who turned out to be right in that uh, situation. Yeah. And uh, I think you're right that, uh, you know, the 60s and uh, quote-unquote postmodern literature is no stranger, to, you know, successful postmodern literature is no stranger to... Uh, um, abstracted narrative structures uh, like the one found in, in That Warm Jacob that uh, certainly go against the grain when it comes to capital L literature, like you say. And, uh, you know, the capital capital J, capital L Jewish literature, uh, this is unusual. Um, but there's a, a place for it. I don't think it, it takes a, a, a huge leap to integrate it into the history of uh, Jewish literature. Mm -hmm. Um and Mursky certainly had connections. In his interview that's forthcoming, he mentioned he hated the fact that his publisher sent a copy to Norman Mailer for a potential blurb. He hated it because he thought that his work was completely different than anything that Norman Mailer was exploring in his own fiction at the time. Uh, but it turns out that Mailer did blurb it with the caveat that it cannot appear on the jacket and it cannot be used for promotional purposes. Instead, it can only be shared with reviewers. Uh, but now, for the first time, we can promote the novel with Norman Mailer's blurb. And he says, oh, can we? Mark Mursky has n more talent... <laughs> Then most people have hairs in their nose. Hey, that's a pretty good review. And, <laughs> that's uh, a pretty money review, too, but I couldn't go on a dust jacket. I mean, Marsky, or Mursky said that uh, in 1967, his nostrils felt flagellated by barbed wires when he 
read that blur because in some sense i guess it's a bit dismissive uh-huh. uh but of course he said in retrospect he treasures it uh it's prick as a pinch of true affection for me because they did this was when they were uh acquaintances at best but they did uh have a friendship later on in life and uh yeah that's a different story that's pretty good i mean i i think uh I think Mailer's certainly very different in sentiment from uh, from this book. Um, yes, he would definitely. I mean, he he's certainly an explorer of uh, that darkness that I was uh, talking about, longing for um, in in Jewish literature. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not a huge Mailer scholar by any means, but um, I I I don't I don't know if huge Mailer fans would uh, would pick up this book, seeing his pull quote, and be satisfied. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> in the sixties. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty interesting. And you mentioned, you know, the Yiddishisms and the Hebrew mm-hmm. words in Thou Worm Jacob could also work against its uh, marketability, so to speak. But on that note, what are some of your favorite Yiddish words, Hebrew oh, slang, etc.? There's just so many. I I I was briefly I had this. Um... What's the word? Not an existential crisis by any means. But I, I went to Jewish school growing up and learned Hebrew. But Hebrew is, uh, uh, I'm realizing, so separate from the uh, my Jewish history um, as opposed to Yiddish, which is, uh, my, my grandfather's first language was Yiddish. And so Yiddish really is the language of uh, my lineage of Jews, not uh, not necessarily Hebrew. Um, so I was taking like a uh, Yiddish Duolingo, um, and then I realized I didn't want to say, I didn't really want to learn how to say, I can't turn on my computer in Yiddish. I just wanted to learn all the non-translatable Yiddish <laughs> words. So I'm wondering, I should, uh, make like a storage system of these words until they become part of my daily vernacular. But some of my favorites, um, I love, uh, Zitzfleisch, which is, uh, I think it, it literally translates to sitting flesh, so mm. your ass, but it's used kind of um, uh, as a as as a more metaphysical quality. So like a, a toddler lacks zitz flesh, <laughs> you know, the the ability to sit sit still. Um, I love uh, uh, farstinkener, which is like uh, like shitty, like a sh- like uh, my farstinkener car work won't start. Um, I love uh, shepping nachis. Uh, nachis is like pride, but I love uh, shepping as the verb quality to it, as if the pride is kind of like falling off of you in uh, in sheets. Mm. I think that's a that's a nice image. It makes one verklempt, which I think has kind of made its way into uh, the English vernacular. Uh, I found out recently um, glitch is Yiddish. Oh, really? Which is probably the most successful uh, Yiddish into English uh, story. What's uh, the glitz. original definition? Glitch? I, I think glitch means uh, when something isn't working right. Uh, it, so uh, it hasn't changed? The meaning hasn't changed? No, it just gets used uh, exclusively in the digital mm. context now. And I love, uh, I talked a bit about it in the uh, review I wrote for the kaleidoscope, but Shlemiel and Shlemazel, which are kind of they're they're less words and more kind of stock characters. Um, mm. uh, although I, I guess they could be used as ad- adjectives. The the way it was always described to me is the Shlemiel is the guy that spills the milk and the Shlemazel <laughs> is the guy that gets milk spilled on him. Uh, I do have Shlemazel on my list of words here. Shtup, Nudnik, Schnorr, Farshate. Schnorr's great. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing most, if not all of them. <laughs> yeah, you got to say it with more... Uh, <laughs> Uh, dread and and anxiety and eroticism in your voice. (laughs) So I assume, you know, you were more familiar with these words as they cropped up in the novel than I was. Yeah, I think I saw Zitzfleisch in there. I think I saw, I think I remember Boba Misa in there, which Mm -hmm. is an old wives' tale. What about this this deceptively simple word? It's spelled N-U. And it's and oh new, and it seemed to change meaning depending on context or inflection, etc. Yeah, new is great. I think new has been cropping up in my day to day language. I hope it's not too obvious of an affectation. New is just kind of, is like so. It's mm-hmm. kind of like a a um, 
a transitionary word. Uh, so you go like on. an um and or, or an uh or no, it's more like um, I think I used it in my uh, my essay where you go on this long, uh, you give this long speech, uh, you, you you proselytize, you pontificate for a bit, and then to break you go new. No. What are we what are we, what are we going to make of all this? Mm. Uh, it's uh, again, yeah, kind of untranslatable, but uh, it feels right. It feels right in my in my voice. Oi Gewalt also kind of untranslatable, but that's that, that I use that every I use that when I'm sitting down. It just comes out. So you told me that you got a grant from Canada, your home country. My home. <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> Can you yeah, briefly I, tell me what the grant is for and, and what you're working on? Yeah, I got a I got a grant from the Canada Council for the Arts uh, to research and develop a feature film, um, and uh, I've been going heavy on the research and less heavy on the develop part. But uh, it's had me spend all year um, diving into kind of what I was talking about with this conversation: the history of Jewish mysticism, Jewish magic. Uh, and folk uh, folklore and superstition, um, messianic uh, hopefuls and uh, the messianic idea in general in Judaism, apocalypticism, just this whole kind of um, strange transcendent occultic quality of Judaism that I've seen crop up in non-Jewish things so much. It, when I see I don't know, occult rituals in movies, there's often just Hebrew letters just strewn around. And I've always kind of thought it was funny, but it, it uh, had me confront why did this, why does this thing that I've thought of as so banal and um, boring, uh, why is it also uh, used as a shorthand into searching for the beyond or searching into the uh, dark corners of reality that science can never plumb. Um, and I've, I've sort of spent all year kind of excavating these strange images for myself that were um, implied at in my upbringing, um, but would end up being esotericized or coded into um, banalities and, uh, and just banalities and normalities and uh and and things that a that a teenager wouldn't give second thought to would this film be a documentary non-fiction fiction it's fiction it's a road trip movie uh that's all i i uh have for certain right now mm. it's still in it's in flux and it's uh, i've been waiting i got the grant in march and i've been waiting for the weather to turn in vancouver to get fully into the nitty-gritty of writing i find i can't really be truly creative unless it's uh the weather's really terrible outside there's a long um, tradition of road trip movies in and of themselves mm -hmm. uh, little miss sunshine comes to mind recently uh, five e easy pieces with jack nicholson mm -hmm. wish you the best of luck on that project thank you and so i'm much. curious if thou worm jacob helped you in your research at all or is it was it just a novel you you read as a break from what you're doing no it absolutely helped uh, i think um i i've had i've been reading either esoterica written in uh no time in particular or you know a thousand bc or maybe 500 ad or or whatever or um explorations of the history of jewish mysticism predominantly in the 1600s or the 1400s or whatever um so it was really nice to remind myself that my film and my work uh take place in the 21st century um which is not too far removed from the 20th century and are therefore imbued with a jewish sensibility that is um in some parts immortal but in also some parts fully entrenched in uh, the time that I live in now. And so if anything, that worm Jacob was a nice jump into uh, a pool of this Jewish language uh, and Jewish language systems and this Jewish language of uh, Jewish uh, manner of speaking um, that you don't really find in uh, 15th century Kabbalist mm -hmm. uh, texts. Uh, so that was really nice. And also reading uh, um, uh, bits of his kind of autobiography, it, it sounds like, uh, you know, some of the books that we've been reading are the exact uh, same. Um, nice. So it's it's nice to see that uh, 
other artists have had this longing for Jewish media that I'm uh, trying to find my place in as well. You told me you wanted to take a crack at the Jewish novel yourself at some point. I'm assuming this is going to have to wait until after your road trip film. It was happening side by side for a while, but uh, as you know, novels take a long time and a lot of attention, so it, it took a bit of a, a, a side step. But I mean, fiction has long been my great original love that uh, that film has uh, taken up more of a, uh, my time lately. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to. I am writing or want to write a, a Jewish novel. I think if anything, if I've discovered anything over the past couple of years is that um, uh, whether or not I believe in God, which at one point felt like uh, the ultimate expression, expression of religiosity, I believe that I'm Jewish and that Judaism is uh, inescapable and it's stuck in me from the way that I speak to the way that I look to the way that I think. Um, and as an artist, it's going to, be stuck in my searchings no matter what mm -hmm. and if as an artist if we uh seek to illuminate all the corners of reality that we're never really going to fully understand uh the only tool that i have to do that is uh the damn jewish god <laughs> you just have to use him as a flashlight unfortunately so uh it's it's been rewarding to find out that i'm i'm stuck with writing jewishly uh, no matter what I write about. And it was Joshua Cohen with his mammoth out of print, so f currently out of print, but now that he won the Pulitzer, probably coming into print at some point, possibly. Vitz is the title, and he claimed that it was the be-all, end-all of Jewish novels, but maybe you can... Uh, maybe I have one more thing you to can, say. Yeah. We'll see. Squeeze yourself <laughs> to... in there somewhere. Yeah, but, uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to tackle it he did, first. He did write some other novels, and at least his latest was a kind of backtracking, so maybe there's some truth to what he's saying, at least within his own oeuvre. Yeah. We'll have to... Well, maybe the novel's over anyway. Maybe. Oh, no, definitely not. <laughs> Don't say that. Well, in that case, in that <laughs> case then, I, then I think both of us have more to say. We have to check out Vitz, maybe. That's something we yeah. can talk about next time if we're... That'll have to be a whole series. If we're of mind. Absolutely. Why not? I'll flex. Oh. I'll stretch. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the show. It was a true pleasure, Jake. Thank you so much for having me. This is a blast. <laughs> So there you have it. Thanks so much for listening to the latest episode of Invisible Book Buddies on the Kaleidoscope Podcast. Be on the lookout for my hefty interview with Mark J. Mursky at thekaleidoscope.com. The site itself is a wormhole of innovative literature. If you enjoyed this episode and want early access to content like the hefty Mursky interview and other benefits, Consider supporting my efforts through our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the kaleidoscope. Together, we can fight against the apocalypse of wordlessness. Thank you, and be sure to tune in again next time.